Get in there. How are you? Good, thanks, Angie. How are you? <laughs> We've both driven in here at speed to get here. <laughs> I've parked a block and a half way and run to get here on time. Because like the weather's nice, everyone's decided to come to the. Can city. I just say, I'm, stay home. You with, I'm running to help with your PT. Can I? I just can't believe it. <laughs> okay, well, we've got some we've got some interesting stuff today. Obviously, yeah. we're going to be talking about social media and its use, but really, sort of breaking news, I guess, is yeah. the um, coronial the coronial court's case that's come out. Yeah, the prosecution it's finished. Yeah, against the court. and this this was the young solicitor who was um, who, who, as part of the course, of what you saw saw traumatic and damaging material, and the findings effectively it wasn't appropriate system to manage that. Very, I mean, very tragic story, but at the end result, $380,000 fine. And convicted. And convicted. Because they found a whole lot of other complaints about toxic workplace, intimidation, awful, awful, horrible behaviour. But it is this big news because it's the first time WorkSafe have brought a safety prosecution, not just for bullying in terms of psychological hazard. It's or or sexual event. harassment. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but for accrued, accrued tra trauma, which is... Can I just say, and this is a salutary warning for all of us. I mean, in our business, we've I've done about 350 serious injuries and fatalities, which means we, we seal off um, photographs of what have occurred to ensure that people are safe. But, you know, I worked as a nurse prior to that. There's a whole lot of jobs where people are visited by trauma or things that can affect them emotionally. And clearly it's an obligation on the employer in those circumstances to actually measure that level of risk and provide appropriate controls around it. So I look, fascinating case, um, because of the tragedy that's involved, and I don't want to delve into too, too greatly, to be honest, but as Nina says, it is it is the fire over the bow that point. says, yeah, yeah, it is a tipping point, and it basically says that if you fail to manage psychological risks, which are, duty. Yeah, which are not in the top three of sexual harassment, bullying and, tr and workplace violence, trauma yeah. and work, it's not going to change and the fine is substantial and it's just a primary duty breach. Yeah, but I think this is giving them more confidence. Yeah, and, this is the end of the wedge. Yeah, and they're going to start pursuing the other more easy to go psychological hazards like high job demands, which is affecting every workplace. Like we've seen it with the test case that they were trying to bring with NAB with the unions. Like it's only a matter of time. It is. And look, we've got the VBA case that started already. Mm. So there's cases that are sitting around us. So that's one thing that's been sort of hot off the press in a way. The second one is New South Wales <laughs> and their inability to make a decision, really. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit. There's been some legislative changes that have come through which have doubled the, the penalty for reckless to 10, 10 years jail. 10 years, and, yeah. and I think something like six or eight, uh, is it 10? I don't know how much, how many million you can be fined now there. I think it's almost 10 million. Yeah. But there was sort of a... a sort of what they did because they hadn't brought in industrial man sort of like everyone else but Tasmania. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but at the same time as doing this, because there's a gross negligence test in New South Wales, which is part of recklessness, which is in fact almost an identical test to workplace manslaughter in Victoria. So they've increased that to 10 years and now they're saying, okay, well, we're going to introduce industrial manslaughter. Next year. Yeah. It's happening. So one sort of, you've got to wonder what happens. Yeah, like, it's like two different. They've got sort of halfway to try and deal with not having it. When they get it, are they going to drop it back to five years and all that stuff? I don't know. But if they don't, you'll find Victoria and Western Australia, Queensland and South Australia doubling their penalties again. And we're going to have this crazy situation where throughout Australia, once again, different tests will apply for recklessness, different penalties will apply for it. Yeah. It was just nonsense. Anyway, we could go on about that, couldn't we? All right, let's just go to our first case um, that we really want to it's talk about. Cool. Yeah, so, and, and that's dealing with overseas employees. And this was an American employee who was employed to work in Argentina mm -hmm. by an Australian business and the place of contract was Australia. That's yeah. where the digital contract was formed. This is not easy law, can I just say, but it has massive consequences because if Australian law applies, and this was a general protections claim that was brought. And it was a jurisdictional objection saying they weren't covered by the family. Yeah, Act. then you've got this issue of Australian safety law applying, arguably the workers', comp. workers compensation, privacy law. Mm -hmm. And remember, privacy law is very different throughout the world, so it has a very, it's a very strong regime in Europe. South America, it's almost an absent regime. So... What this does, it means if you're contracting, the form of con the, the form of contracting is Australia, then it's an Australian contract, therefore Australian law applies. 
Yeah, I think the test was it had to be performing work outside of Australia and that the contract wasn't formed, formed in Australia. Australia. So there's That's two the tests. only way you can be the exception. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in old days, this used to be called the, po the postal acceptance rule. So in the, in the area place in which you accepted the contract, yeah, signed it right. and posted it, that used to be the form. But now, because it's digital, if you're sending it from your digital thing and someone signs it and it's accepted here then, because this is the place of DocuSign, I'm afraid. So I could be anywhere in the world and I sign it and you're in Australia and then it becomes... Yeah, I'm the employer. Because so is... you're the one who's receiving yeah. it. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Scary, isn't it? Think about that. <laughs> okay. I just... Fun. Look, this is something which... I we've got two cases it, yeah. today, one on ignoring consultants and one on not having very good consultants. Probably I went too far, did I? But this is one about ignoring consultants. Nina. Yeah, so this one was, I think, an interesting case because they built it to be so much bigger than it was. Like originally, so it, it was involving a mine and um, the superintendent of the mine had gone in to inspect the walls because four workers had come out and said sediment was falling down. When the superintendent went to inspect it, it fell and crushed him. And the fact that I think 10 extra people had been coming in and out. They were they said it was extremely serious and they brought reckless conduct charges against the organisation and the CEO, 14 charges, and they yeah. were up for a maximum penalty of $35 million. What did the consultant say first before we come back to what happened? Yeah, yeah no, no, no. Wait, well, I'll, get there, I'll get there. I'll get there. But eventually it wound way back to just four simple charges um, for failing to breach and what really sunk them was the fact that they had received advice from a consultant that raised this risk yeah. and who had outlined how they could easily fix it and they ignored it. They did nothing about it. And the key thing, which I'm getting to, you would calm down, is <laughs> Sorry, that in a rush, <laughs> it wasn't covered under legal professional privilege. So all the time when there is a safety incident, we always advise clients to engage a consultant under privilege to go in and do an investigation to find out what was wrong and how to fix it. If it's done under legal professional privilege, that report is not accessible to WorkSafe. And we've had cases where when a client does it themselves out of best interest because they're wanting to get it fixed, WorkSafe will then make a Section 100 request to request it and they can use that to form the basis of the prosecution. And like we saw in this case, really helped the evidence. Or well, the other one is just do what you're told. Apply <laughs> the consultant's advice. I mean, if you're going to do it not under privilege, yeah, then, that's then you've got a gun pointed at your head and you're really going to yeah. say, do you feel lucky, punk? You know, it's sort of Clint Eastwood stuff, really, oh, isn't God. it? <laughs> and by the way, delay is not an excuse. If you say, oh, we we're going to get around to it, that doesn't fly. No, 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 it doesn't fly. It just makes you look dopey. All right. Okay. The other. Whiffin case. This is. We're going to move on to the next case, which is. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. You clearly. Just... <laughs> so, I'm going to say the wrong thing, aren't I? Yeah, really? you are. So this is a small business employer who terminated an employee because they didn't follow law firm research instruction and often acted beyond their role. The problem was they didn't comply with the small business fair, small business, business fair code. dismissal code because they didn't let. The employee knows that the meetings were disciplinary meetings. Didn't in the warnings, didn't let them know there was a risk of termination. Created a performance improvement plan and then didn't comply with it. <laughs> and their whole defence was around the fact that, hey, we engage a third party consultant, so we shouldn't be liable for this. And it was one of those generic. I'm being <laughs> now. I'm being, can I, can it, I just it, say, if you buy dumb it. advice, you're just as liable as having no advice at all. That's it, the truth. It was yeah, one of those generic services <laughs> which just give you a bunch of templates, but no tailored advice. And they did, just applied it without really thinking it through, such as creating a performance improvement plan and not following it. And so they got slapped. <laughs> well, Nina and I constantly see um, off the shelf advice from i'll call it off the shelf sometimes it's in person so it's somebody who fell off the shelf oh gosh but safety advice and hr advice and i just want to be clear about it getting dumb advice doesn't help you it creates a liability for you you either get good advice pay for it and determine a am i going to get it under privilege or b am i going to follow it but taking something off the shelf and trying to plug it in to a business doesn't, doesn't work, work because all safety and all HR is built around 
process and consultation. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're going to have to fashion it to meet your business and that you actually need some skills, okay? Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump ahead. We're, we're moving okay. New South Wales, <laughs> we've got HS drill. Well, rock it Well, I just got to laugh at them, don't you? So I'll tell you oh, what it is. God. They've moved category one offences, which is recklessness, and that also can involve gross negligence from nearly four million to ten and a half million. That's huge. Yeah, officers can move from about eight hundred thousand to two million. And, and then other individuals is one million. Now. Yeah, and off to jail for ten years. Now the, the reason they did this is, well, who knows what goes on in New South Wales worksite and, and the legislators. But what they did really is this is a halfway house because they didn't have industrial man, so they had one under the Crimes Act, very hard to prove. The answer is the only sensible answer is there's some sort of sop that they can lift it up a little bit for the more serious sides. And now they're going to introduce industrial manslaughter. It's sort of like putting the cart before the horse, isn't it? Really? But to be honest, in every other jurisdiction, it's kind of the same in that although industrial manslaughter has been introduced, they're all just turning to um, reckless endangerment. Well, they're, 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 pleading, pleading, they're pleading them down, but it's easy yeah. to prove industrial manslaughter and there's recklessness. And that's the difference. Yeah, this it's whole it's regime totally is stuffed because mm. it is so much easier to prove the more serious offence and the subjective intent yeah. that sits around reckless endangerment. So this is just another piece of nonsense in our safety regulation where we're now going to have Australia having every different jurisdiction different again, and it is just calamitous really, isn't it? The other changes were extending the insurance ban. Yep. So all the contracts that have it are automatically void now. This has made that explicitly clear. And I think new police, police powers, powers around the gig economy, which I don't know if it's going to make a whole lot of difference. It's only relevant to the gig economy and it forces them to issue penalty notice if they're not providing proper PEPA yep. for delivery drivers. Anyway. Let's, let's keep following New South Wales. That'll be fun. WA have amended their workers' comp legislation. There's some interesting parts in that. Some Not that big a difference. They've moved from 13 weeks to 26 weeks as the preliminary insurance period, which is really the no-fault part of it. What, what they have done, again, only WA would do something like this, is they've banned it's employers. Or, no, no, no. WA is crazy in this stuff is they've banned employers and insurers coming along for medical appointments oh, yeah, for the, for the fear of discriminate, which is absolute crock. One of the biggest problems when people go to see doctors who are injured is there is no proper and reliable evidence as to the inherent nature of the work, yeah. nor is there any proper discussion had about return to work. So what they've just done is torn up 20 years of really good practice in returning people to work in a safe manner and also making sure that the assessment of the person against their inherent requirements is actually accurate. Yeah. So it's a nonsense, but it's in there. It's probably going to drag things out even longer now to yeah, turn employees yeah. back to work. Okay. On to um, the main topic. I'm not right. really happy with legislators at the moment, oh. as you've probably guessed. But let's go to the major topic, which is social media, the do's and don'ts. I, I want to talk to you briefly about um, We've got three cases. I'm not sure we've got them up as labels, actually, but we no, have not So Drasovic is a Victorian uh, full court, Supreme Court case around privacy. Let's Before we talk too much about it, let's just talk. There are two elements to social media. One is, uh, is it in work or out of work? Because obviously if someone is doing something in social media on at work time, it is a work-related activity, okay? Yeah, like if you're on LinkedIn, for example. Yeah, therefore, we can we can kick to the second question very easily on that. But what are the real risk is when someone hits social media when they're out of work, and that is the Rose and Telstra question that we've talked about. Out of hours conduct. Yeah. yeah. So is it something which um, damages their capacity to return to work? Is it something that damages the reputation of the organisation, or is it fundamentally inconsistent with their contract of employment? So if I publish something on social media saying FCW is the worst business that ever existed, which would be silly because I'm an owner, but if I was to do that, it would be reasonable for the business to say, well, that's absolutely inconsistent with the continuation of your employment and it damages the reputation of the organisation. Therefore, I can deal with it in a disciplinary circumstance. So the next question that comes out of Jurassic is, okay, good. Then am I allowed to look at a post if I have high privacy settings because it contains personal and sensitive information, including that view contains personal and sensitive information about me. And what they said is, very simply, before we get caught up in the clutter of noise that sits around this, privacy law will apply to the extent you seek to assert privacy. So if you put high privacy settings, then you can't easily 
look at that. Now, that's changed by a couple of things. One, if on that social media you identify yourself as an employer of an employer or, or could, you could be reasonably said to be an employee of an employer. Like when they wear a uniform. Yeah, that type of thing. <laughs> Well, at that stage, you've torn up your privacy part yeah. because what you're actually doing is representing yourself as yeah. part of the employer. But if you're not that, and that's what your asset is, then there is an exception to privacy law that says, under this, this doctrine, if what you said was something that creates a workplace risk or harm, that could be the organisation or to an individual, <clears throat> and if in us seeking your consent, as we would be obliged to because the high privacy setting, it provides you with an opportunity to eliminate or remove that post, then you're entitled to view it and rely upon that post as a matter of law in any investigation and disciplinary process. Okay? Now, that's not hard, is it? It's because safety trumps privacy. That's it. Mm. So when we look at the other cases that have come up, we've seen some really interesting. I think there's the, the very recent case in the cloud and project day day. Um, oh, that one was so weird. And I'm going to refresh my memory on that. That is, yeah, the two unfair dismissal applications where they looked at social media from a person who you, wasn't an employee. Was an employee. And you see at that stage, there is no lawful way that you can look at that person because that is per, not a person who's publishing a post whilst they're an employee, end of story. Unfortunately, with this, this case law, it's so badly argued before the commission and what comes out of the commission is so ordinary that we don't see the underlying principles that apply. No, because they, they're more focused on the fact that it was around breach of confidentiality because they were discussing salaries and stuff like that. But the way that they found the information was, you're right, they went through a previous employee's phone, uh, sorry, work phone who had logged in and the em another employee logged in and read those posts and then reported it back to the employer. Yeah. So how could that possibly be deemed to be okay? Yeah. Well, it's unlawful. And the problem is when you get un something unlawful, the question is, are you then allowed to rely upon that in the court? And there's a number of discretions. Teresevic has a very limited role under which you can rely on those. And that's what the case is about. And look, we've seen a couple of other cases. We saw Thompson and 360 Finance, which was a guy who published some rude memes about a girl. The girl let it go the first time, said don't do it, and he went and did yeah. it again. There's a whole lot of those cases, but where they go to hurt or affect somebody, then, and they're out of work, Rosenthalstra says we can look at them. Mm. The next question is, is there something, is there a privacy wall that sits in front of us? And the answer is, Jurezovic, if there is a privacy wall, because there's high privacy settings, then you can penetrate that privacy where there is a risk that in the investigative process it will be damaged. By the way, this is exactly the same thinking that goes on where we stand someone down. We stand someone down so they can't interfere in the investigation. Yeah. We're, we're, they're really willing and able to work, but the law says there is an exception to protect the integrity of evidence yeah. in I the investigation. Does that make sense? I hope so because you can't respond. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, it's been a long time. to publish this one. <laughs> <laughs> Then we have to go live. Okay. So let's go to the case study now, okay? And this will be fun because Nina and I haven't talked about this one, and I did this one at between 9.15 and 9.30 oh this my morning gosh. while I was driving. <laughs> Guns for Hire Lawyers DL had a strict social media policy which included a prohibition on publishing anything on social media, identifying yourself as an employee, harassing or otherwise improperly treating another employee. The policy was an off-the-shelf policy and had an out-of-hours coverage clause for misconduct and confidentiality clause. David, a senior lawyer, was sick and tired of the weekly performance check-ins run by a HR consultant with his principal. Rather than mentoring and developing him, it was more like a performance improvement plan. He explained to both it was not a helpful process. His workload was unstructured and a huge volume, which meant he could never keep up and it was stressing him. Their response was that he needs to be prioritising his work. He was feeling confused, stressed, and was having trouble sleeping. After a few drinks one night, he superimposed a pig's head on the principal's website photo with a speech balloon <laughs> saying, yes, we love you, but here are 3,000 things we want you to give priority. Where did you come up with this? <laughs> it went onto his Instagram account, which did not identify him as an employee, and he had no work friends on his account. 
It had the highest privacy setting and he was a member of the old St. Kevin's Rowing Club, as was the HR consultant's husband, Trevor. Trevor showed his wife, who took a screenshot and provided it to the CEO and principal. David was called into disciplinary meeting, offered a support person and then summarily dismissed by the CEO. There you go. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> How do you come up with this? <laughs> was David's dismissal an unfair dismissal? Okay, well, what are our four tests? The first one is... Valid reason. Was it a valid reason? Mm, God, it's close to not being a valid reason, isn't it? I think it's a valid reason. I think you can argue that that is misconduct. Okay, well, let's say it's misconduct. Yeah, I mean... The you, pig's head? bullied someone. Like, what do you mean? If, if I did that to you, that's not okay. <laughs> you get me down. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we should be saying come to the next meeting. You have to read it and understand it, but you get the snort. <laughs> okay, so, so valid reason, okay, and obviously, although it's, we should go through the out of bounds yeah. conduct and everything like that, yeah. um, although he's not made it clear that he's an employee, the fact that it could cause harm to another person, it's making fun of them, I think is enough. Uh, okay, you. we'll stop there. The problem is it's got a high privacy setting, no other employee, nobody would recognise that person as the CEO. Well, this... This and guy recognised, like, well, how else did Trevor <laughs> raise well, it? You know, there was that, enough there to, to, well, to raise the attention. I think you're, you're, you're reading between the lines. <laughs> but I'm just saying at that stage, this is not, um, I'm just trying to think of the name of the, the Aboriginal, the, the case about the Aboriginal um, organisation where the guy who was a um, helping young men with drinking, not helping them drink, but helping them managing drinking and violence, Got drunk on the weekend and oh yeah yeah, yeah. Well, its name escapes me it normally doesn't but anyway and he was locked up and then he was terminated and the court said yeah well look when your job is preventing people from harming themselves and harming others and you go and do just that then you meet all three tests you damage the reputation it's inconsistent with your job um, and you're placing others at risk so you get it but he wasn't he was just making a comment and put a big set off I think. Even if you don't say it's like the reputational damage, the moment it came to the um, principal's attention, that's misconduct. You, they know it's about them. That's you, right. Okay, I just want to test. It causes harm. Like, yeah, okay. But, so I think the real issue with this is um, when you look at the issue as a whole, you could not summarily terminate this guy. You could give him a warning. So it's unreasonable. You've got to a yeah, stage well, where the... the Punishment doesn't fit the crime. Yeah, well, they didn't even do a show cause process. Well, just, like, just, yeah. just pretend like <laughs> yeah. it. Okay, but I'm saying that here the level of naughtiness is pretty low. Yeah, it's, you'd, you'd give him a warning. You'd give him a warning and, and probably pork for a week. Okay, so that's the first question. Second, could David's dismissal give rise to a successful general protectionist claim? Well, it would. The, dismiss, the, the dismissal would have to have been because of a protected attribute or his safety complaint, but he isn't, I don't think. Well, you got to, you got to wonder why something either, either the principal is a very brutal character or, 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 or like crackly, like yeah. or, oh, or, or oh, there's something else that's playing on his mind, like the criticism being made of the performance improvement process and the raising of the safety issue. I think I, it's yeah, got a I general protection smell about it. I don't know. Like, I don't think someone terminate, or I don't think they'd be terminating him because he's complaining. I think, yeah, performance maybe, but that's not a general protection. Oh, no, no, I think he's raised complaints. He said he doesn't feel safe, and then they get him in on but a big set. they're not terminating and him because of that. But remember, it's reverse onus is going to be hard to set, sell, isn't it? I would defend this case. I know you you'd defend any case, though. <laughs> particularly if someone was wearing a pig's head. <laughs> Could David have brought a workers' compensation claim because of the poor conduct of the HR consultant? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and a winner too, I would have thought. Yeah. Absolute winner. Yeah, and definitely safety breaches. Okay, talk me through the safety breaches. Well, he's identified several psychological hazards, you know, this high workload, it's not clear on his expectations, no support. Um, they're just telling him to just no, do No reward and recognition. Yeah. yeah. Um, just constant. And he's sought extra help with it and they've just refused him. So I think, yeah, in that case, it's definitely yeah. a safety problem. Well, I think if you've got that, that many safety problems, your general protection is starting to look a little bit better. That's... But it has to be because of that. That's the missing thing. Yeah, that's not the way it plays out, though, is it? Oh, All right, thanks for joining us on a really weird <laughs> yeah. kind of workplace.
<laughs> yeah, thank you for tolerating. What happens right? when I come back? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, the pig's head. What can I say? You know, the Godfather could have been a horse's head, but this time it was a pig's head. All right. Thanks for watching. Love to have you back there. Give us a thumbs up. Yeah, give us a thumbs up. See you later. Bye bye. bye.